Okay, again, thank you for joining us. I'm Kelly Kurd, Senior Digital Marketing Manager here at MPS. And today I'll be joined by Pete Millette. Pete is our Senior Technical Marketing Engineer. Today we'll learn about common DC motor drive usage scenarios and techniques to resolve issues with various stresses and faults in real world operations. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. We are recording the session and it will be available for on-demand streaming within the next few days. So uh, we will send out an email uh, with those instructions, or you can look for it at monolithicpower.com forward slash webinars. You are muted during the course of the presentation, but at the end, we will be taking questions. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom webinar interface, you'll see as you mouse over the bottom, you'll see a QA button. You'll, you'll be able to click on that, type in your questions, and we will make sure that, that they get answered. All right. And from here, I'll turn it over to Pete and let him uh, make the presentation. All right. Thanks. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Pete Millett, Senior Technical Marketing Engineer at MPS. In today's webinar, we're going to talk about fault conditions that can occur in motor drive systems and the protection features of motor driver ICs. As for me, I've been working with motor driver ICs for about 15 years, uh, doing product definition and systems and applications engineering at MPS and at Texas Instruments. Before that, I worked for many years as a board level hardware engineer. So here's the agenda. First, I'll review the basics of how DC motors work and how we can represent them with a simplified electrical model. We'll discuss normal operating stresses in a motor drive, which mostly occur when starting, stopping, or reversing a motor. We'll look at the protection features that are typical in motor driver ICs to help prevent damage from those stresses. Then we'll consider some abnormal conditions like short circuits and voltage stresses. Before we dive into stresses and faults, I think a brief review of how a DC motor works is in order. At its simplest, we can electrically model a DC motor as a voltage called the back EMF in series with a resistor. The back EMF is a voltage generated by the motor that's proportional to the motor speed, which is caused by the windings cutting through the fixed magnetic field of the permanent magnets in the stator. That series resistance is simply the DC resistance of the winding. This model doesn't include commutation. The commutation, whether it's mechanical, as it is in a brush motor, or electronic, as it is in a brushless motor, is separate from this basic electrical model. So this model applies equally to brush or brushless motors. <clears throat> Torque, the rotational force generated by the motor, is created when current flows through the motor. In the presence of a static magnetic field from permanent magnets, current flowing in the rotor winding generates a force that attracts and repels the rotor poles relative to the stator. The left-hand rule shown here gives a visualization of that force. This force is translated to a torque at the motor shaft. There are no mechanical load applied to the motor. When a voltage is applied to the motor, the motor would spin and accelerate until the back EMF rises to be equal to the applied voltage. At that point, in a perfect world, there would be no current flowing. When a torque is applied to the shaft, the motor will slow down a little bit. That causes the back EMF to decrease. Now there's a voltage difference between the voltage source and the back EMF, so a current will flow through the winding. That current is what generates the torque. Of course, this is a simplified ideal approximation. In reality, there are losses, and there's always some current flowing. There's frictions in the bearings, friction in the bearings, for example, that always requires some torque to overcome, which in turn causes some current to flow. 
So here's a typical small DC brush motor and some of its data sheet specifications. You can see that the nominal rated continuous current of this motor is one amp at a voltage of 24 volts, which corresponds to the maximum allowable continuous torque load. So one would think that the motor driver needs to only support a maximum of one amp of current. That's all, that's all the motor can, can use. However, note that the DC resistance of the motor is only 6.7 ohms. That means when you first apply a voltage source of 24 volts to the motor that stopped, the current flow is 3.6 amps. That current, the current that flows when the motor is stopped is called the stall current. When the motor stopped, the back EMF is zero. So you can see in this model, when you first apply voltage to the motor, the current's only limited by the series resistance of the motor. This resistance is generally pretty small, which results in a large current flow until the motor starts spinning. This current's normally much larger than the rated continuous current of the motor. So the motor driver must either be capable of driving that full stall current to get the motor spinning or provide some current limitation to soft start the motor. Otherwise, the motor driver might activate a overcurrent protection function. If it doesn't have any overcurrent protection, it could even be damaged. As I mentioned, one way to deal with the high stall current is to use a motor driver circuit that has the ability to control or limit the current. With a current limit, you may be able to use a motor driver IC that's rated to deliver less than the full stall current of the motor. The waveform at the left shows a current of about 3.6 amps was needed to start the motor, after which the current dropped to about 100 milliamps after 60 milliseconds when the motor had reached full speed. There's no mechanical load on this motor, by the way, so the, the low current is just what it took to overcome losses. At the right, I've applied a one amp current limit to the motor startup. You can see the peak current has been decreased, but also that the amount of time it took to get the motor spinning to full speed, that's the point where the current drops, is now twice as long, 120 milliseconds. So many motor driver ICs have a feature that allows them to provide this type of current limitation but you do have to consider the mechanical system when doing this. You still need to provide enough current to generate torque to overcome friction and stiction, and also to be able to accelerate the mechanical inertia of the load. As you can see here, the amount of time that it'll take to get the motion motor to full speed is increased. If there's a large mechanical load, especially something like a flywheel, it'll be, the time will be increased even more. Instead of a current limit implemented in hardware in the motor driver IC, um, if a motor control algorithm is implemented in a processor, the algorithm can limit the motor current by implementing even a simple open loop duty cycle ramp by slowly increasing the duty cycle to get the motor going or by actually monitoring the motor current and uh, closing a current regulation loop. By the way, if you're wondering about the ripple in the current waveforms here, it's a result of the motor's commutation. The current goes up and down as the winding current is switched from one commutator segment to the next. You can see the frequency of that ripple increases as the motor speed increases. So to stop the motor, you can simply disconnect it from the voltage source and it'll coast to a stop. If the voltage supply is disconnected, the motor current goes to zero, the current has got nowhere to go. So the motor decelerates, mostly due to mechanical losses like friction. Coasting to a stop doesn't stress the motor driver, although you do have to realize that the back EMF does get applied back to the output of the motor driver, um, which would be in a high impedance state to let the motor coast. If a fast stop is required, uh, usually the winding is shorted by the driver, which causes the back EMF to generate a current that provides a braking force. 
In this case, the current flow is mostly the back EMF divided by the series resistance. That back EMF starts out at whatever the voltage source was. So that's the same as the stall current. And as the motor slows down, the current will decrease. So any kinetic energy stored in the mechanical system gets dissipated as heat in the motor winding resistance and also in the motor driver. If there's a large inertial load on the motor, that can result in quite a lot of energy being dumped from the mechanical system back to the motor driver and the motor windings. Current limitation or some sort of active control may be needed in this case, the same way as for starting the motor. Otherwise, the motor driver might be subjected to excessive current and the overcurrent protection might operate. Abruptly reversing the motor is an even worse situation. So if you suddenly reverse the polarity of the supply, the voltage source and the back EMF are now in series and of the same polarity. So the effective voltage applied to the series resistance is almost twice the source voltage. So the current flow will initially be approximately twice the stall current. That's not only a huge stress on the motor driver, but in some cases that much current can actually demagnetize the permanent magnets in the motor. You can damage the motor. Current limiting either in the motor driver IC or in a control algorithm may be needed in this situation. All right, now we'll consider some abnormal conditions that a motor driver system might encounter. The first stress is a, a short circuit. Due to defects in the motor or the wiring uh, or a simple accident like the slip of a scope probe, the output of the motor driver might be subjected to short circuits. When the output of a motor driver is shorted, very high currents can flow. Most motor drivers have circuitry to protect themselves in the event of a short circuit, but under some conditions, they can still suffer damage. This overcurrent protection typically activates at a current that's substantially higher than the current the driver is designed to deliver on a continuous basis. In some cases, the driver will latch in an off state and require some intervention from the system, like removing the supply voltage before it'll turn back on and drive again. In other cases, the motor driver may automatically restart after a short period of time. Even with overcurrent protection, a low resistance short is a very stressful event for the motor driver. The waveform shown here, this is a motor driver rated to deliver five amps of current, shows a peak of nearly 40 amps. Such a high current will result in high power dissipation in the IC, which may cause some thermal problems, especially if the motor driver automatically re-enables itself after the short circuit. Although most motor driver ICs are designed to protect themselves from a short under normal conditions, in extreme cases, like supply voltage is close to the driver's maximum limits, high ambient temperature, or the repeated application of a short circuit, Short circuits can sometimes still damage the driver. In addition to the current drawn by the motor, the voltage supplied to the motor driver needs to be considered. Clearly the motor driver IC must be rated to accommodate at least the supply voltage used to drive the motor. If excessive voltage is applied to a motor driver, it'll likely be damaged as the internal circuitry breaks down. But you also have to consider transient events that can cause the supply voltage to increase. One situation that can cause the supply voltage to increase relates to series inductance in the power supply. When the current through the motor is interrupted, this inductance in the supply will cause current to continue flowing for a short period of time that causes the voltage at the motor driver to increase because that current has nowhere to go. The worst case for this is when there's a short circuit, which causes a very high current to flow, then the motor driver shuts off in response. 
So this is normally mitigated by using a large bulk capacitor across the supply located near the motor driver. If you use too small of a capacitor and there's substantial upstream inductance, like long wires between the driver and the power source, the motor driver can be damaged. Another potential voltage stress happens when the motor is actively decelerated. This happens when a control system wants to decrease the speed of the motor quickly. It does this by reversing the polarity of the current applied to the motor. And it's hopefully in a controlled fashion to provide a torque in opposition to the motion. If the power source were perfect battery, then energy would just flow back to the battery and be recycled. But in the real world, usually the power source is a DC power supply. And unless the supply is specially designed, it, DC supply can only source current. There's a diode here, right? Because it cannot sink current, the only place that energy has to go if it's coming back from the motor driver is into the capacitance that's part of the power supply. There are a few ways we can deal with energy that's recycled back to the power source. One is just to place a large amount of capacitance on the power supply. In some cases, that may be all that's needed. Depends on the mechanical system. Another way to deal with that energy is to use a clamp across the power supply, like a TVS, a big Zener diode. The clamp is designed to break down at just above the normal operating voltage of the power supply. When recycled energy causes the voltage to rise, the clamp breaks down and protects the system. In some cases, uh, again, depending on the mechanical system, an active clamp circuit can be used to dissipate the energy into a resistive load. That pretty much works by looking at the voltage and turning on a switch to uh, drop that energy into a resistor. So even though you can think of motor drivers as switches, in reality, they're switches with resistance. So when current is delivered by the driver, there's power dissipated in the resistance. This power, which is proportional to the square of the current, generates heat and causes the temperature of the motor driver to increase. As the temperature increases, the resistance of the FETs also increases, and that results in even more power dissipation. Integrated circuits can only tolerate heat to some limit. Most motor driver ICs have an internal temperature sensor that'll shut down the driver if some threshold exceeded. However, in the event of a fault, like a short circuit, that generates a large amount of heat in a small area on the silicon, quite often just one of one FET, it takes time for the entire integrated circuit to get hot enough for the sensor to disable the device. When this happens, a hot spot can develop that can damage the IC before it can shut down. Now we'll show a little detail about what's inside a motor driver IC to help protect it. The first protection feature highlighted here is overcurrent or short circuit protection. This is protection that's intended to prevent destruction of the driver IC when a short circuit is applied to the output. The short could be across the outputs as what might happen when the motor windings become damaged. It could also be from one output to ground or from one output to the power supply. Driver IC should be designed to respond to any of these faults. All the motor drivers from MPS include protection against short circuits. To implement overcurrent protection, the current through each MOSFET needs to be monitored. If the current exceeds some threshold, which is significantly higher than the design nominal current rating, the driver will sense an overcurrent event. In some implementations, the voltage drop across the MOSFET is sensed while it's turned on instead of directly measuring the current. The voltage drop should be quite low during normal operation. If it's not, then that's an indication that there must be excessive current flow through the MOSFET. There's normally some intrinsic intrawinding capacitance in the motor windings, 
Also, sometimes capacitors are added intentionally across the terminals of a brush motor to help minimize brush arcing and the EMI that that causes. When the motor driver first turns on, it has to charge these capacitances. That results in a spike of current right at the time when the output is turned on. In some cases, this can cause the motor driver overcurrent protection to trip, even though there's not really a short circuit present. To prevent false trips like that, some delay time, called a blanking time, is introduced in the driver before the overcurrent protection activates. Because of that delay, if there really is a short circuit when the motor driver turns on, there's going to be a large pulse of current flowing before the part can shut down. So the system needs to accommodate this, especially as it relates to the input supply inductance and bulk capacitance, as we mentioned earlier, because you're gonna go from a zero current state to a very high current state for some amount of time, um, 100 nanoseconds maybe, and then back to zero. To protect against high resistance in the power MOSFETs when the supply voltage gets low, most motor driver ICs have a comparator inside that senses the supply voltage. If it's too low, and if it's too low, it may prevent the MOSFETs from being fully turned on, the RDS on will go up, then operation of the device is prevented. Similarly, a comparator may also sense the voltage to shut down the outputs if the voltage is too high. Note that this provides protection from MOSFET damage due to switching during a high stress over voltage event. But if the voltage is too high, the device will still break down and be damaged. Note that most motor driver ICs also provide some sort of fault indication output to signal to the rest of the system that there's a problem. Some more advanced drivers have a serial communications port, which can be used to determine exactly what sort of fault has occurred. Finally, almost all motor driver ICs, including all motor drivers from MPS, have a thermal shutdown feature. So like we discussed before, current flow through the MOSFETs results in the heating of the silicon. If the temperature rises too great, the device may malfunction and eventually be damaged. To prevent that, the temperature sensor, or sometimes several of them, monitor the temperature on the silicon. If it exceeds some limit, the part will be disabled until it's cooled to a safe, safe level. Some parts also include a thermal warning to let the system know that the temperature is dangerously high so the system can take some action like reducing the current to prevent the shutdown. So that's it for the webinar on motor driver faults and protection. In summary, Think about the stresses on the motor driver during high current conditions like starting, stopping, and reversing the motor. You may have to implement hardware or software to prevent the stress from damaging something. Minimize the inductance in the power supply and add bulk capacitance, and in some cases clamps, to prevent transient voltages from damaging the motor driver. Also, consider the impact of heat generation in the motor driver, especially during high current conditions like motor start, stop. And for more information on motor driver ICs, visit www.monolithicpower.com. Great. Thank you, Pete. At this time, we are gonna open it up for questions. If you mouse over your Zoom webinar interface, you'll see a QA button. Go ahead and click on that and you'll be able to type in any questions that you might have. I'd also like to remind everyone that we are recording this session and we'll have it available or on demand within the next few days. So as it says on the screen there, look for it at monolithicpower.com forward slash webinars, and we'll also send out an email reminder. All right, I see we have a question coming in. 
So the first question is one, any papers on sizing the bulk capacitors? And two, the MP6535 has a brake pin. Does this short circuit the motor? Is it best to PWM this pin for braking? Good questions. Um, sizing, sizing the bulk cap is not, is, isn't real trivial. We actually have an application note that, that goes through some of the calculations to figure out uh, how much capacitor you need for a given amount of energy. But to do that, you need to know how much energy is being pulled back from the mechanical system. So that's not easy to figure out. Um, my guideline is usually as much as you can afford, both physically and uh, you know economically, because capacitors cost money. Just as a guideline, I mean, a, a, a sort of random guideline, most often for motor systems of say a few hundred watts um we see several hundred microfarads like a 470 microfarad cap for smaller drivers proportionally smaller um you know a really small motor may only need 47 or 100 microfarads of capacitance um, the more the better the other question specifically about that part and i'm not 100% sure without going back to look at the data sheet, but generally um, most parts that have a brake input pin do um, do a short brake. So for a brushless driver, they usually turn on all three low sides, um, a brush driver, both two low sides. Um, so it depends on exactly uh, the driver. Some drivers will actually current limit in brake mode um, the ones which uh, have internal FETs and are sensing the low side FET current can use that to actually do a current limit within the IC. Um, some ICs, pre-drivers with external MOSFETs, for example, um, don't have that luxury because when they do turn on the low sides, the current's recirculating just through the FETs. And in that case, it might be a good idea to do a PWM on the brake pin. So it depends on the IC. If the IC can monitor the current during brake mode, it can do a hardware control. Otherwise, a PWM on the brake is uh, is not a bad idea. And you could uh, you could do it open loop. You could start at a 10% duty cycle and ramp it to uh, to 100%. Uh, the best way is actually to get a current probe on the motor to see what's happening. Next one up is, how is IR compensation achieved? What is the basic technique involved? Not quite sure um, what that question relates to, to be honest. IR compensation, um, if, if, yeah, I, I don't quite know what the question means, to be honest. Um, Maybe maybe he can clarify a little bit. If if it has to do with compensating for winding resistance changes with heat, for example, um, I don't know. It, it, I know they do that in FOC algorithms, for example, by uh, maybe directly measuring temperature, but also estimating what temperature rise might be given current and time, but. Uh, yeah, I'm not really quite sure how to answer that question. Okay, if you do want to clarify that question, go ahead and retype in some more detail and we'll come back to you here in just a second. Uh, next one up, do any of the MPS motor drivers have built-in PWM inverting signals inside the power module? So at the moment, I don't believe we have anything with PWM generation, meaning the digital logic to generate the PWM inside. We do have a part coming that does that, uh, but not yet. If uh, you're talking about using a single PWM input as opposed to separate high side, low side, we do have a lot of parts that do that. Some parts, the traditional way to 
do motor drivers, especially for brushless, is to have a separate input for the high side and the low side. And that means a microcontroller has to have two PWM outputs for every motor phase. Um, but we, all, we, we do have a lot of parts, uh, versions of them with a single PWM input, if that's what the question was. But as far as internal PWM generation, uh, not at the moment, but it's coming. Okay, uh, next up, kindly elaborate on protection of drives, PWM also have some of how it leads to high inrush current for the motor due to the motor also getting effect. Um, I'm, I'm really not sure what to elaborate on. I mean, the, that's, that's what a lot of the uh, beginning of the presentation covered, which was why there's so much current that starts flowing when the motor uh, first activates because there's no back EMF. Back EMF is just proportional to the rotor speed. So if the rotor stopped, the back EMF is zero and the amount of current flowing is just set by the resistance in the system. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything other specific that uh, we wanted elaboration on maybe uh, if, if he has a more specific question that would be a little bit uh, a little bit easier. We had a second question from the same person that was, is there are there any drives which minimize the harmonics generation automatically and so hence it will be the best choice always? Yeah, that's a bit beyond the scope of uh, of this subject. Um, that gets into three phase motor control. And I mean, to, to answer the question, I'm not aware of any ICs which implement that. Typically that functionality is implemented in firmware. Great. Uh, let's see. We had more of a comment about the 6535 as a pre-driver. So I think PWM is the best. Anything more to add to that, Pete? That would that would be the case because the pre drivers um, don't have separate current senses for the three uh, low side MOSFETs. So the recirculation is the parts essentially blind to that recirculation. It's not measuring the current. So a PWM ramp um, would be potentially a good idea. On the other hand, since it is a pre driver, the external MOSFETs can probably handle a lot of current. Um, so depending on you know, the motor and uh, the MOSFETs used, may not need it. You may be able to just slam the brakes on. The motor will stop very quickly when you do that, um, but it may be okay. Okay, another one that came in. Uh, what is the range of the RDS on in drivers from zero to 100% PWM duty cycle for say three, 3A? So the RDS on will, I mean, it doesn't vary with the duty cycle directly, right? Um, the RDS on of each Fed is a function of temperature mostly, uh, a little bit supply voltage, but, but mostly the temperature. Um, as you vary the duty cycle, Linearly, effectively, you're varying the RDS on, I guess, if you look at it that way. Since a motor is an inductor, uh, as you turn a half of an H bridge on and off, um, you are modulating the voltage to the output. But the RDS on really doesn't change much. Um, the RDS on will be constant. And for a motor driver that's driving three amps, the, the RDS on will vary depending on the IC and also the, the supply voltage, lower supply voltage. Uh, parts designed for low supply voltage often have higher, lower RDS on because silicon is cheaper. Um, but the, the RDS on for a motor driver IC like that may be anywhere between 50 and 250 milliohms. Another piece of that puzzle is thermals. Um, 
very small packages have to have lower RDS on because you can't get as much heat out of them. So you might find a, a motor driver rated at three amps in a tiny package that has very low RDS on and one in a really big package, still three amps might have a much higher RDS on because you can get more heat out of that bigger package. Okay, next one. Is it possible to use power MOSFETs with PWM waveforms to break a little bit the mechanical load while spinning? Um, hmm. Yes. So that kind of relates to one of the one of the earlier questions. Um, you can apply pulse width modulation to a brake signal. And what what that's doing, whether it's a, a, a DC brush motor or a three phase motor, normally what that's doing is turning on two low sides or three low side FETs at the same time. And you can pulse width modulate that to vary the average braking current, which will change how fast the motor will stop. Okay, and next up, uh, which things decide the rating drives? Why can't we? Why why can't we add high rate a high rating motor to small drives? What is the part of the drive that will get much affected due to high load? Is it an inverter part or is it a capacitor part or which part? by which we have selected correct sizing to avoid fall. So hopefully you're reading this one as well, Pete, because that one had a bunch of sub questions. I, I, yeah, I think I follow it. Um, it's, it's the power devices that, that are the concern. Now for a pre-driver, which uses external MOSFETs, it would be those external MOSFETs. If it's an integrated motor driver, it's the MOSFETs inside the, uh, the IC. So there's a couple of limitations, and, and we kind of talked about those earlier. One of them is thermal. Um, if you have a really big motor connected to a really small motor driver, um, especially at start and stop, and also under heavy torque load, uh, the current is going to be high. And if the current's too high, the on resistance, the RDS on of the switches, internal or external, um, will cause them to dissipate a lot of power and they'll get hot. Um, that's one concern. And the other is if there's, assuming there's some overcurrent protection, then it'll activate. If you connect a really big motor to a really small driver, the driver is going to think it's a short circuit. So it'll just trip off. Um, you can overcome some of this, like, like I talked about, by implementing some current limiting, but only to a certain point. You know, if you take a thousand watt motor and connect it to a, a hundred watt motor driver, probably um, at the maximum current of the small motor driver, you may not even get the motor to spin. You may not even have enough torque to make it, uh, you know, overcome its losses. So, you can do that to a limited extent, but but it depends again on mechanics as well as uh, as the motor itself. Okay, looks like that was our final question. So again, thanks everyone for attending. We will have the session available on demand and look forward to seeing you at future sessions that we hold as well. Thanks everyone.